This afternoon's session is Plain Language for Greater Legal Services Delivery. And our guest speaker this afternoon is Anna Still. She's a senior consultant at Just Tech LLC. And as part of Just Tech's Boston team, Anna's working with New England based clients to develop and implement strategic technologies that are in line with their unique needs. Anna got her start in legal services technology at Legal Assistance of Western New York, where she assisted in administration of a variety of innovative technologies related, related initiatives, including LSC TIG funded projects. Anna continues to work with Law New York on a part time basis as a technology coordinator for special projects. Okay, I'll let you take it away from here, Anna. Great. Thanks so much, Miguel, and hello, everybody. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about plain language and how we need to think about that in our legal services delivery. A uh, quick note, point of information, um, I am working from home and my dog just had surgery, so she's feeling a little bit irritable, so sorry if you hear any barking. Um, so, uh, as Miguel said, my name is Anna Steele. Um, I'm a senior consultant with Just Tech. Uh, Just Tech is a technology consulting company that provides services uh, in the technology space to uh, primarily to legal services providers. Um, our team is made up of mostly former legal aid folks or folks who worked in nonprofits. Um, so we have a really great team of people uh, to help legal services organizations uh, with some of their technology needs. Um, prior to that, I was a technology coordinator at Legal Assistance of Western New York. Um, and then a little bit, I guess, about my background. So I graduated with a degree in international relations and um, then became an AmeriCorps VISTA at Legal Assistance of Western New York, helping them with veterans work, um, thinking that I wanted to go to law school. Um, I quickly realized that law school wasn't necessarily for me, uh, but loved the community and the mission of legal aid and wanted to stay involved. Um, and fortunately, I was able to do that uh, through my interest and love of technology and kind of marrying the two. So the mission of uh, legal aid with the um, use of technology to spread access to justice. Um, and it's been a really, really great, uh, really great opportunity, really awesome community. Um, so I'm excited for all of you to begin your fellowships uh, in your various programs. So the law is complicated, right? And there's really no denying uh, that it's full of extremely complex and uh, uh, terms and full of jargon. Uh, as attorneys working in legal aid with low-income clients, it's really, really important to present legal information uh, in an easy to understand manner. Uh, whether you're writing a letter to a client or developing posting materials or offering legal information content for your organization's website, um, it's something that you really need to be thinking about pretty regularly. Um, so the average reader reads between a fifth and eighth grade reading level, um, won't carefully read a document longer than one page, and will give up on a document that is confusingly formatted. Right? I don't think there's necessarily any surprises here, um, as you know, no matter what the reading level and no matter what the education level, um, you want to be able to keep your interest, right? I think that we've seen that in the way that we get our news um, so this, and absorb other information, right? So this really isn't something that's specific uh, to low-income folks or folks with lower education levels. Um, it's really just kind of an important way to think about things in general, right? So if the average reader can't read your work, uh, who are who are you writing it for, right? If they can't understand what you've written, or don't read it because it's too long, or it looks too complicated, um, why are we spending the time writing it? Well, for the most part, right, we're writing it because people are under the impression that having information available is better than having nothing there at all. Um, but that may not necessarily be the case with legal information, right? As I meant, as I mentioned, and we'll mention throughout, the complexity of this. Uh, of a lot of the information out there uh, really can can hinder uh, the access to justice push. 
So again, right, I'm going to start off by focusing on plain language. So this is a cartoon from XKCD. It is his upgoer 5. And he is explaining what this upgoer 5 is only using the 10 hundred words that people use the most often, right? So it becomes very, it's, it's very interesting the way he explains, right, a rocket ship with the quote unquote 10 hundred uh, words that people use most often, right? So this is what I like to, to show to kind of demonstrate uh, plain language, right? Using plain language means writing in a way that ensures that readers understand the content quickly. Uh, easily and completely as possible, right? As a non-attorney myself, I find it to be incredibly important. Um, we spend our entire academic career being told to write in complex, verbose sentences with flowery language. Now, as legal aid advocates, we have to suddenly put all of that on hold and forget about that and try to get our point across in the simplest way possible. Um, I remember the first couple of letters that I wrote to my client as American Vista, my supervisor, <laughs> bringing them back to me, being like, this you can't, you can't send this out to them, right? No one's going to understand that. Um, so remembering like simple sentences, short words, right? Um, kind of uh, like Randall Monroe did here in the XKCD comic, right? Limiting your language to only very, very common words. I know it can be tricky with the law, um, but it's definitely something that we want to do. Uh, the, so the Plain Language Writing Act was um, passed about, I think about 10 years ago, probably a little bit more now. Um, and it is designed um, so that the, our regulatory system has to ensure that regulations are accessible, consistent, written in plain language, and easy to understand. Right? So that's something that um, our government is pushing to do. Now, uh, since the Plain Language Act has been passed, right, there's a series of websites available on plainlanguage.gov for the different uh, aspects of our government that show their plain language websites and resources. And it's not always, you know, a lot of them haven't been updated, but at least the message is there and this is what is being uh, pushed. Right, so through the Plain Language Act, um, you know, it's necessary for obtaining using plain language in any document that folks need to use to obtain federal government benefits, uh, their taxes, right, explain to the public how to comply with requirements the federal government administrators administers or enforces, right? So the, the federal government has really done a, a decent job, not a perfect job, right, but a decent job of kind of pushing this mission. And we want to make sure that we're translating that into, um, into legal services. Right, to, to make sure that the information that we're writing is accessible. So why, right? Why is any of this important, right? It facilitates access to justice. Again, the law, making the law accessible just continues to push, um, push folks to better understand what their rights are in certain issues, right? It's a limited English proficiency issue. Um, folks that are speaking English as a second language or third language, it's going to be much easier for them to understand uh, plain language and content that's written in a basic manner rather than more complex legal jargon. Right, it's an equality issue. Everybody should have the same access to the information regardless of their education level. And it all comes down to, right, the course belongs to the people. And we've really, unfortunately, there's been this growing disconnect that, that the access is not is not for everyone, right? This whole idea of this concept of justice for all has been um, is slowly being pulled away uh, because this information it just isn't accessible. So we aim to create uh, replicable plain language forms, right? A lot of these forms can be designed in a way that aren't necessarily specific to laws or concepts within. A specific jurisdiction, right? So we want to be able to create forms that can be used across different states, across different jurisdictions, um, right? Basic forms you can use in your office to help people indicate which language they speak, right? So we want to create innovative trainings for this, right? How can we best train folks on how to use 
utilize plain language. And frankly, uh, we want to create experts in this area, and we want to create uh, make people excited about um, about this concept. So before you kind of start, before you as you're sitting down to write content, right, whether it's legal information content for your website, or it's um, a letter to a client, uh, you want to think of you want to think of this list, right? So who's your audience? Who are you writing to, right? In many cases, it's low-income people, people who are in distress, um, people who are concerned for uh, their well-being, right? What do you want to say? Um, do you want to just give them a basic uh, letter describing their rights? Do you want to give them full-on pro se material that they're able to represent themselves in court with? Do you want to make sure that um, make sure that uh, they have that that information, right? So, what do you again? What are you writing in this document? Um, are you writing something completely new? Are you giving your reader the information that they need to know to decide if they want to attend a program or an activity? Um, are you trying to change people's behavior, right? So, are you uh, you want to make sure that you mention how even small changes uh, can bring benefits that are important to your reader, right? Or is your document a how-to text? Um, you want to be sure to include any background information uh, that your reader may need in order to understand these instructions, right? So how will your reader use this document? Right, again, will they, are they uh, trying to follow instru your instructions on how to uh, get to the court on time? Right, is it a quick reference tool? Uh, so is it a basic know your rights is a basic know your rights documentation? Um, will your reader need to read the whole thing to get a thorough understanding of the subject, um, or do you just want to highlight certain parts of it? Right. Uh, how do you organize the information? Uh, <clears throat> what does your reader uh, need to know most? Right. What is the main message or theme um, of your documentation? Right, deciding what information must be included and what can be left out. Right, then you want to think about this information and divide it um, into primary and secondary points, um, so you are able to uh, develop your language accordingly. Right, create a structure uh, for your document. It will make it easy and enjoyable to use. Chronological order is most often the best way to do things, especially for step-by-step -step instructions. Um, if people already know something about the subject um, and you're sharing new information, right, you want to start with that old information first and then introduce the new, right? Make sure they're familiar with what they need to be familiar with um, before kind of launching into a brand new concept. Uh, if you are describing something completely new, um, like I said, you want to make sure that um, you're getting into the basics before uh, the really specific kind of application procedures or rules um, that you're trying to get people to focus on. So how should you present this information, right? To decide on your document's format, you're going to want to uh, ask yourself if the, your audience has any special needs, right? Should your document be multilingual? Um, do you need to use large print, larger print um, on a right? If you run your, if you run a wills clinic and you're writing to a lot of elderly folks, right? You want to kind of think about that in terms of um, the letters that you're authoring. Um, do you need to include drawings or pictures? Um, should it be in a pamphlet or booklet instead of just a one page or on a website? Right, so these, so kind of thinking about all of these things are really important as you're launching into um, the development of your document or letter. So we're going to take a do a quick exercise here. This doc, uh, this paragraph here is 62 words long, um, and so I want everybody to take a second and read this uh, read this paragraph here, and I want you to come up with how to say exactly what is being said in this paragraph in 
um, a shorter sentence. I'll give you guys a minute or two to do that and uh, go ahead and put it in the chat window when you are done with that. And I'll give you guys a few minutes. Yeah, with GoToWebinar, drop it into the questions box and then we will um, publish it to all. Perfect. Sorry. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> no All right, we've got one in. All right, a couple more seconds. If there's anybody else who wants to put in an answer.
All right. So this is an example from uh, plainlanguage.gov uh, that they gave of a paragraph that's too complex, right? Very clearly, this is far too complex. Um, and so the example that they gave for the less complex version of this gets it down to nine words. Right, most night jobs would keep teenagers off the street. More night jobs, excuse me, would keep teenagers off the street. Right, that's a little bit, um, that's like very, very simplified, right? Uh, most of you uh, came back with ones that were examples that were slightly um, more complex than this one here. Um, so, uh, you know, you want to, it's important to note that you want to make sure that you are still covering all of the information, uh, but simplicity is key. So, again, um, a quick kind of checklist um, for uh, what to kind of prepare yourself for when you're writing in plain language to make sure that um, your documents are uh, written in a way that are understandable by the greatest number of people, um, especially your clients, right? So um, I'm just going to pause here for a second, let folks review that, um, and uh, let me know if you have any questions or thoughts kind of before kind of jumping into um, our next part here. All right, so a brief history um, of the plain language movement and how um, it's kind of how I've seen it through my eyes, I guess, in legal services. Um, so right after I started at Law New York, um, I worked with a gentleman named Jeff Hogue. He was my supervisor, the supervising attorney and technology coordinator at Law New York. Um, he really uh, was a huge advocate uh, for plain language um, and was instrumental in the development of a series of uh, plain language tools that you'll hear me talk about today, write clearly and read clearly. Um, Jeff did a variety of uh, plain language projects through uh, LSC, the Legal Services Corporation um, Technology Initiative Grant Funding. And uh, over the past oh, I'd say eight or so years, uh, the tools and resources that have been developed as a part of these grants have evolved um, fairly significantly. Uh, this has been definitely a group effort. There have been a lot of uh, really great, really smart people involved in this. Um, we have done a lot, Law New York has done a lot of work uh, with Transcend Translation, so out of California that specializes in uh, translation services, um, plain language is a big part of uh, what they do, um, so they've been instrumental in putting together a series of trainings, um, document resources. Um, there's a website that, while still hasn't been updated in a while, still has a lot of uh, relevant information called writeclearly.org. Um, and on writeclearly.org, um, you can find, a, as I mentioned earlier, um, resources that translate well from organization to organization or jurisdiction to jurisdiction, there's a significant number of uh, plain language resources uh, up on that website that you can, um, that are free and available for everybody to use, that you can download um, and edit to meet the needs of your organization um, and your clients. Um, other folks who've been involved in the projects that I've been working on, um, I mentioned Maria and Jeff. Uh, we have partnered with folks at uh, Idaho Legal Aid Services to help uh, to help build some of these tools that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and we've also partnered with uh, Urban Insight, uh, specifically their kind of open advocate division, who helps uh, with the development of statewide websites for legal aid content. So. We've uh, had a really great, really great support. And uh, one more 
the same person who I want to give a quick shout out to. Um, his name is Brad Reese. He was an intellectual property fellow at Law New York years and years ago who helped uh, with the initial development of uh, the Write Clearly and Read Clearly tools that I'm going to talk about today. So to make uh, plain language something that is a little bit easier for folks to achieve um, within the legal services community, we developed, Law New York uh, helped in the development of the Write Clearly uh, plain language tool. Write Clearly uh, is a Plain language authoring tool, um, we wanted it to be free, we wanted it to be easy, easy to use and convenient for folks to use. Um, in its first iteration, it was a Google gadget um, that shows you how old this was. Um, so it lived on writeclearly.org. You could go to writeclearly.org, put in your text, upload a document, or upload an A to J uh, interview file, and it would point out um, what uh, was and was not plain language uh, and help you uh, make better language decisions. Uh, Google Gadgets has since then sunsetted um, and we were working pretty hard to figure out another way um, to make this information available to folks in an easy uh, user-friendly way um, that wouldn't necessarily interfere uh, with um, with your workflow, right? Having it, having something that matches your workflow is key when we're talking about uh, plain language and authoring tools. So I know it can be risky, but we're going to give a live demo a shot here. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, a number of factors can go into whether a live demo can be successful. So I'm going to give this a shot. If uh, if we have trouble with it, I have some slides. So. Um, Assuming folks can still see my screen here, um, we have up here uh, Open Advocates page, uh, Open Open Advocates Write Clearly page, right? So this gives you information about um, the Write Clearly plain language authoring tool. So, uh, like I said, our goal is easy to use. So all you need to do is click and drag the bookmark. Uh, to your bookmarks toolbar, and it's there. Um, that simple, nothing to download, nothing to install, no processes to go through, and permissions to accept or deny, um, just drag and drop. So once you have that in your toolbar, um, you can look at any website that you are currently on. Um, here I am on a uh, legal information uh, website page from Law New York. So if I click the Write Clearly button here, it runs and it tells me what the grade level is of this article here. It will then go through and highlight, in this case, 77 different places uh, where it has suggestions. Right? The general suggestion summary um, says I need to shorten some long sentences, replace some complex words, a simple alternative to use gender neutral language, um, avoid underlines, caps, and um, and avoid underlines and caps. So as I move through this, it tells me, um, it, it highlights the sentence for me and tells me um, what words I may want to uh, change, right? This says unexpected. I can tell it that I want to keep this word or to try a simpler word. If I click try a simpler word, it'll give me some synonyms um, that may or may not be useful. Uh, this just queries a general uh, dictionary at this point. So again, as you keep going through, um, it's telling me to shorten this sentence. It's again uh, questioning the word utility, whether or not I want to keep the word or try a simpler word. Um, if I were to, if I was doing this on a development environment and I or I were to go back and make changes and then re-upload this. If I run it again, um, nothing's going to change on this site because it's the same document. But if I run it again, it would tell me whether or not the score went up or down if I ran two pages in a row. So this keep this word, try simpler word function um, is something that we recently built in to try and make the tool a little bit smarter. 
um, we log uh, which words people say should be kept um, in order to make the tool a little bit more smarter and a little bit more useful. Um, well, I'll show you some examples of that here uh, in a little bit. But again, um, very straightforward, um, very user friendly, uh, and easy to use and uh, on your own site. Um, so try it out. Uh, definitely try it out. Uh, be careful though; you can easily kind of get into a rabbit hole and start uh, spend the next half hour uh, kind of checking a bunch of stuff for plain language. Uh, but it's important. It's important. So uh, definitely uh, try that out. Again, you can access that at openadvocate.org slash write clearly. Um, the, this here is, um, oops, is the list of uh, words that I talked about. Right. So all of these words, people said, keep this word. Don't get rid of this word. We like use, um, or don't highlight this word as a problem word. And as you'll notice, um, some of them, particularly the ones in red, we decided um, as administrators on this project that we didn't want to get rid of those words, right? Termination, substantial, reconsider, connotation, we believe actually are too complex um, if we're aiming to write between a fifth and ninth grade, re a fifth and eighth grade reading level. So we, uh, the administrators on this have final say about what gets, about what gets, uh, added and what gets deleted from here. Um, but I just wanted to kind of point this out as um, a method that we're using to make the tool more useful. So the next piece here um, is I just wanted to highlight a change that we recently made to show folks, um, while this isn't necessarily a plain language issue, um, it still is a, a language issue for sure, uh, to show folks the importance of using gender neutral language uh, in your in the development of your website and content creation. So anytime that Write Clearly uh, finds a place where you say his slash her um, or anything similar, it'll point out that um, you want to use uh, gender neutral language, um, giving you uh, tips on how to do that uh, in a way that makes sense, many of which revolve around um, using singular versions of they and their, uh, which are becoming definitely a more acceptable way um, to, uh, to write in a way that uh, makes people more, more comfortable um, rather than using uh, gender-specific language. The other new piece, um, which I will also do a live demo of, is we incorporated uh, right clearly into Google Drive. So if you're a Google Drive user, you can test your document right there live uh, in, your, um, in your Google Drive document. So here I've added the add-on um, from the uh, Google Drive add-on shop, I guess you could call it. Again, it's free. So if I show the right clearly toolbar, it comes up on the side. I can highlight the text that I want to talk about or that I want it to evaluate. I ask it to evaluate and it gives me the reading level and tells me suggestions. So for folks who either don't have a dev environment for their website um, or are work writing letters or writing things live, um, you can do, you can u still utilize the um, power of write clearly in the development of your materials. So that is Write Clearly. And the part of, one of the great parts of Write Clearly is that I mentioned the keep this word, uh, use simpler word, things like that. Right, this is a, this is a very organic project. Um, and we definitely uh, want to continue, continue to collect feedback from the community. So if you are using this tool, please let us know. Uh, please give us feedback and also, um, you know, the more people who use it, the smarter the tool is going to be, um, and the better, and the better it's going to ultimately be. So, read clearly um, is the other tool that I wanted to discuss quickly. Now, read clearly is a glossary. So, again, we had the same goals as we did with write clearly, as we wanted it to be free, easy to use, and convenient. Um, again, this started as a 
as a side project and then was wrapped into a TIG, an LSE TIG grant, um, and was crowdsourced. There was a, a document that people put together of complex legal terms and their um, definition, and then this was supplemented by um, some online dictionaries. So if you highlighted or hovered or clicked on a word on a web page, it would a uh, bar would pop up on the top and it would give you a definition. Um, now to show you this in action, I'm going to do another little demo here. And we'll grab this one here. So this is the same article and you'll notice there's this little purple box on the side. Uh, if that if the checkbox in there is checked, then that means that read clearly is currently activated. So you'll notice there are lines with our words with purple lines underneath it. That means it's a word in the read clearly dictionary. If I hover over that word, it gives me a definition. And again, to help uh, allow the community to give us feedback, we have the thumbs up and the thumbs down saying this is helpful, this is not very helpful. And again, we can take that data and uh, make changes to our glossaries. Um, we recently launched uh, the Spanish component of our English glossary. So if I was to hit the Spanish button here, it would also give me that definition in Spanish. So, you know, a lot of our clients may be able to read um, really basic uh, phrases or phrases, paragraphs in English if they're non-native English speakers, um, but they'll want a description um, of that term in their native language to make it a little bit easier. So we've recently implemented that. Um, we've also implemented a uh, test Spanish glossary so that on websites that are made up of Spanish content, the glossary exists uh, in full Spanish as well. So it works the same exact way as the English, as the English glossary works. It, we have a series of words that were uh, a mix of the crowdsourcing from the first time around and then also um, words with the help of uh, terms with the help of the folks over at Transcend Translations really building that glossary out. Um, so we would love to expand the Spanish version um, and also love to expand into the more um, into some other languages as well. Okay. So the new feature that has been recently launched with this is the ability to have custom glossaries. Um, this is something that we've been getting requests for for a long time. Um, however, it was technically complicated um, and would potentially be a, a support nightmare for the folks who are administering uh, these tools. So, but the, uh, it now exists. You can build custom glossaries, some states, uh, wanted custom glossaries or people wanted glossaries specific to different areas of the law. Um, and now that is possible um, through GitHub. Uh, we have a GitHub repository. Uh, you could just submit a pull request with your new glossary. Um, Abhijit from Urban Insight and I uh, would review and approve the glossary and then it would be available. Now to get read clearly on your website requires a little bit of back-end work, but not anything more than adding um, a Google Analytics JavaScript snippet to your page. Same thing, just a JavaScript snippet that you would add um, to the back-end of your web page. Um, if you all are working for programs that uh, use uh, Open Advocate as their, as their website or as a statewide website, then um, this, become, this comes built in. Uh, you can simply select the glossary uh, that you would like to use uh, for that um, for that web page, and it's all built in right there. Again, if you guys are using Open Advocate, so taking things beyond the text, right? And I know you have had you had another presentation on design this morning, um, so I won't get too too much into this um, but I just wanted to um, kind of talk about the importance of readability uh, beyond just the words on the page so um, to 
Right, you want to make sure, and again, this applies more to website content development <laughs> rather than um, rather than writing a letter, but it still does apply, right? So you want to choose, you know, hopefully I'm preaching to the choir here, right? But you want to choose a uh, type that is clear and easy to read, uh, pay attention to how the text looks on the page, um, you want left flush justification, and you want to use illustrations and graphics effectively. Um, again, so the clear and easy to read, you want to avoid excessive uh, italics or a crazy font. Um, too many uppercase letters can also create problems for readability. Um, so you want to really focus on fonts that are easy to read. Um, and you can use bold to highlight important information, you just don't want full kind of paragraphs of um, bolded text. You know, it's funny, when I was making this slide, I had a flashback to when I was in elementary school making like horrible PowerPoints with excessive clip art and like comic sans font and, and all of that ridiculousness and I couldn't help uh, couldn't help but laugh at myself a little bit but I was now giving a talk on how to do that in a way that was less ridiculous. Um, so again with the organized text piece right where uh, where possible you want to um, use bullets and short sentences to highlight uh, the important pieces of it to make it more readable, <coughs> utilizing white space properly. Um, and then effective use of graphics and illustrations. You want to use it in a way that allows folks to understand um, the text. You don't want to overdo it with the graphics. Uh, that's not going to be useful for anybody. You don't want to put graphics in the middle of text, right? You want to use it to complement it. Um, and placing it on the page in a way uh, so your reader is not jumping around, but that they can read the information that they're supposed to read and it can be supplemented um, with the necessary graphical information. So here's an example of that. Um, I, I know that, uh, I'm sure this morning you heard a lot about Margaret, Hager, Margaret, Margaret Hagen and the legal design work that she does. Um, so again, I don't want to get too, too repetitive here, but this is an example of something that was designed by folks at Law New York, it's still a work in progress, it's not the final version, but how to get uh, through the foreclosure process um, in New York State. So again, much more effective than just a block of text on a web page. Um, so we were, were really excited about this, um, and there's a variety of free and low-cost tools out there um, that can help in the development of uh, infographics and uh, easy to uh, easy to use um, and easy to read uh, documentation. So I'm going to leave you with uh, plain language goals from George Orwell's Politics and English Language. Right, I think it's a kind of a good summary of what I've talked about, um, and, and just something again, right? As much as I want. Uh, there to be more experts and more people who are also kind of evangelizing in the importance of uh, the plain language movement and legal services. I think it's just important at the end of the day um, that folks really, really think about it, really consider it. Um, you know, as you become uh, lawyers and supervisors and you're supervising legal work and you're passing on this information to others, right, it's really um, important. It's far more than just a language issue. It really is an access to justice issue, um, and it really is something that we all should be uh, thinking about in our day-to-day -day work. Um, so that is all I have as far as formal presentation goes, but if anybody has any questions or comments um, or concerns, I'd love to hear them. So a lot of what you're suggesting here is very contradictory to how law students are taught to write. What is the best practical advice for them to really give this a try? Um, how should they go about getting better at it as they work on projects? Is it just write uh, clearly.org, the tool, or what else would you suggest for practicing? I would look for, there's a ton of exercises out there um, similar to the one that I put up on the screen that we did earlier. I think just 
even silly ones like that, right? It's not necessarily applicable to the law, right? It's not necessarily legal jargon that you're trying to cut out, but really kind of getting your head in that headspace um, where you want to to do that. So I think um, there's a lot of literature on it, right? Reading up on it. Um, you know, I used to put a little sticky note on my computer that said plain language. So every time I was drafting something, granted, not a law student, so I'm not ingrained as deeply as you guys. Um, but so I would just remember uh, to do that because it was it, because it was ultimately very important. So uh, seek out some exercises. Um, right, clearly, org, like I said, does still exist. Um, there is some stuff on there, but there's also a lot of great stuff on plainlanguage.gov and some of the other uh, other websites out there. Hey, Anna, uh, what are some common documents that uh, you can foresee fellows using plain language uh, on over the summer with some of their technology projects? Um, well, it depends. I mean, uh, it depends on what kind of technology projects uh, folks are doing. Um, what are what are some examples of just brief examples of some of the things that folks are working on or thinking of working on? Uh, I believe uh, some are working on document automation tools, uh, uh, existing content on uh, different websites. Uh, it's a mobile yeah, app. There's definite interest in uh, in video and multi-language production also. Yeah, I mean, all of those, I think, are really, plain language is really an important part of. Um, so any sort of document automation you're doing, regardless of tool, right, whether you're using HotDoc, ATJ Author, Neotologic, um, you know, any and all of that. You should definitely be putting your questions through a sim uh, right clearly or a similar tool, um, or have somebody you work with kind of read it for plain language. User test, user test, user test, user test. I cannot uh, stress that enough um, how important it is to uh, use user testing, uh, find a client group um, to help you kind of analyze that and figure out whether or not you're on the right you're on the right track. Um, even if it's not a client group, right? Somebody who is not um, in the legal space, right? That's the best place to start. Uh, if you're not doing any formal client related user testing, someone who's not a lawyer, um, if you have undergraduate interns coming in, things like that. Um, so how, um, how do you put together that uh, user testing uh, portion? Like how, how does that go about? So there's a couple different, a couple different ways you can do it. You can have um, formalized focus groups, right, where you bring in, uh, you formally bring in folks and you, you run, you run a focus, you run the focus group on the language. You can also, uh, there's a series of different tools that you can put on your website um, to help you test um, what is being, you know, where people are clicking, um, how they're using the website. Uh, keeping track of your analytics tools, right, isn't necessarily formalized user testing, um, but keeping track of your analytics tools in a way that allows you to see um, what articles people are reading versus not, the duration of time that they're on a particular website. Um, you know, are you seeing trends? Are people spending more time on websites with lower uh, grade level to them? Probably, I would imagine so. Right, so there's all sorts of ways, uh, both formal and informal, um, ways to do user testing. Uh, Brian, you probably have some other ideas there too. Yeah, we've. Um, I mean, I definitely agree that if you've got the time um, and the opportunity, focus group testing is going to be the best. But um, taking someone who is not familiar with the law at all, having them read it and let you know what it says or follow the directions um, works really well. The undergrad example or interns that have no uh, connection with the law because a lot of what 
you're looking at in that situation is we don't even realize that we're using legal jargon when we are because we're so used to it after being ingrained for several years. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Um, and as far as the video production piece goes, too, I mean, this is also very relevant in that, right? The spoken word, um, while not readability, right, you still want to um, have a sense of that the material is easy for folks to understand, right? Um, if you're doing, which I highly recommend you're doing, if you're doing any video content development, um, you should definitely be uh, closed captioning them. Um, so making, so that, making sure that you can run your closed captions or your scripts through plain language uh, tools and editors um, to make sure that uh, that is all um, the way that it should be. Uh, same with if you're going to do um, subtitles, right, making sure that um, that they're in, presented in a way uh, that is very easy to read and understand. Any other thoughts or questions? Um, so I guess one thing I do want to say, um, if anybody does have any thoughts or questions on plain language in general, on the Read Clearly or Write Clearly tools, or your projects in general, um, I'm a, a huge junkie for this stuff. I love I love, love, love the connection between legal aid and technology. Um, so I'd love to hear from you guys, and I'm looking forward um, to hearing uh, what you guys are working on and, and hearing about the final projects and the fellowship program in general. Thank you, Anna. I really appreciate you taking the time out of the day to uh, come teach us about write clearly, read clearly, plain language tools. Um, I believe. Your presentation was very practical, <laughs> and we uh, really appreciate it and look forward to staying connected with you over the summer. Yeah, thank you so much for coming in. I greatly appreciate it. I, I wish that more law schools would uh, listen to this presentation and actually teach it as part of a law school. Oh, I know. That would be amazing. Someday, maybe. <laughs> well, thanks again, guys, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.